Alright, hey guys and welcome back. We are going to look into part 4 today, which is Change Machine. And uh, I've had a lot of fun actually trying to uh, just go through this story. Um, of course, narrating it to my recordings is uh, also me reflecting on what I've watched. And I realize the, the more I go through it, uh, the more I not only see flaws, but I also see that there are a lot of things that I've missed in the film. A lot of hidden details, a lot of Easter eggs, and I can't wait to do the Easter egg X uh, compilation, uh, but I'm also working on some other uh, films that I want to review, and I've been trying to get access to a lot of other films. It's just so difficult to uh, need to, you know, check which uh, site I need to subscribe to just to get a copy of the film, and it's so much work. Uh, I'll be really glad if uh, you know the cinemas open soon, so that I can actually go and just watch whatever I want instead of needing to to wait for HBO Go or whatever it is to release it. Because uh, I don't have HBO Max where I am, and uh, man, it's such a pain. And uh, as for Disney as well, you know, you gotta get Disney Plus, and then you gotta get Netflix for Netflix films. Man, it's like such a freaking headache to need to subscribe to like ten different things just to watch uh, whatever it is you want. And um, I mean, times like this, um, it's it's a lot easier to stay subscribed because you you know that you can't really go out during you know uh, especially the situations that we're going through. Uh, so it's not so harmful, but the moment uh, you know the, the floodgates open and the restrictions are off and the vaccines come in and whatever, uh, you know you gotta like unsubscribe to everything because you're barely gonna watch TV as is. You're just gonna be looking out for films that you that you hear are good, right? Anyway, I'll have to f I have to cross that bridge when it comes. So, for now, let's just go through part four, change machine. So, uh, what I really like about uh, part four is that things really, really start to escalate, right? Uh, we've we've gone through a lot of different character arcs, a lot of different builds up, build ups, and stories, and uh, I really like that. I really like the way everything was done up to this point. But uh, from here on, uh, you're basically halfway through the film. Uh, right, it's like a, an hour 50 plus in and uh, let me just get my video up or rather the film up uh, HBO yeah, okay All right, I'm, I just hope there's no limit to how many times I can watch this because I would kill HBO if that's the case All right, uh, so uh, Yeah, we're about an hour and 50 minutes in and uh, let's just go on uh, we start off by having the shot of uh, Jim Gordon actually summoning the Batman using the bat signal and uh, really beautiful shots of Batman. Let me just uh, straight up just let you guys know that um, I don't have repeat this but every shot in the film is wallpaper worthy and every shot in the film is visually like astounding. There's no film made with, uh, with such artistry uh, and attention to detail in terms of that. So uh, we see Wonder Woman, Batman, Flash and eventually Cyborg, Cyborg join in to form a team of four, uh, answering Jim Gordon's uh, plea of as to whether there's a way of stopping these uh, parademons. And uh, we get some nice jokes here from the Flash, of course, uh, and you know the, the team heads out to these tunnels under uh, Gotham Harbor or something. And uh, they are essentially looking for uh, where Steppenwolf is keeping these uh, kidnap scientists to interrogate them and this is like a temporary hub this is something that's close to the city so that he can actually uh, try to get a hold of the uh, mother box that is held by man and the reason they've set it up here is because they have caught a scent of the mother box around this region so they know it has to be here so they set like a, a, a frontal uh, temporary base right uh, in order for them to expand their territory and uh, their search radius within that designated area because they know it's got to be somewhere there because the demons picked up the scent there uh, so they just like you know uh, setting up and whatever so the league gets in and I found this part a little bit weird like uh, Batman's asking Alfred uh, where are we and all that and I felt that that was more of Cyborg's role because Cyborg clearly has mapped out the area he knows um, you know uh, these maps and whatever because he, he's the one who told Jim Gordon that these are underground tunnels uh, so I felt it was just weird asking uh, Alfred but maybe because they just wanted to show that Alfred is playing a part and they didn't want it to be such that he only shows up when 
uh, they need to control the uh, what do you call that the, the the crawler you know the night crawler or whatever so I mean fine fair enough they just want to show that Alfred is there joining the team but uh, we also realize that eventually it becomes Cyborg's responsibility and Alfred may have uh, less of a role as we go later into the story because Alfred of course is a good uh, psychic to Batman, but when it comes to, to planning things out, mapping things out, and also providing the knowledge, uh, Cyborg is the digital god of the Justice League, and he will take over that responsibility when it comes to the team. So we see the team head out into the tunnel, look for Steppenwolf, and we see Steppenwolf interrogating the scientists, and eventually as he interrogates uh, Victor's dad, uh, Victor comes in to try to you know, uh, protect his dad from Steppenwolf. And uh, here you can see a little bit of choppy CGI with uh, Victor's face as he rips these metal bars. You can see his face seems a little out of position. And I think one of the possibilities is that uh, this face, uh, or rather this shot, was completely not planned. Uh, and because of that, this face of uh, Victor that we see is completely CGI because, uh, what's his name? Uh... Oh man, what's the actor's name? Uh, I can't keep forgetting his name. Uh, just Zack Snyder's. Okay. Da -da. Ray Fisher, right? Yeah, Ray Fisher. So Ray Fisher is probably not in, you know, t or not in this scene. So, so this scene was probably uh, just, you know, CGI in because they maybe had already shot it and they felt that they didn't want to call back uh, Ray Fisher just for one or two second clip. Uh, so they just uh, added in a CGI cyborg and also perhaps that scene may have been difficult to capture so they just went ahead with the full CGI. And yeah, that's that's the parts you can see that there's lack of attention to detail in terms of the CGI. But maybe they thought we'll let it slide because uh, the rest of the CGI looks fine. And so much so is true. Uh, Steppenwolf faces Wonder Woman here and the CGI is really, really incredible. You can see how realistic uh, they've made Steppenwolf look, uh, the metal on his body, the glow, the shine, uh, and also whenever the light from the axe uh, that he is holding, uh, you know, shimmers, you can really see the parts of the armor that it hits, and not just his armor, it also hits the armors of the parademons, the light of course, the light from the axe, the armor of the parademons, the, uh, the armor of... Uh, the Wonder Woman and her shield, and the flooring and the ceiling, the the whoever you know like worked on the CGI for the lighting is an absolute mad lad. Let me tell you that, because the lighting's uh, effects and the reflections are just insanely good. There's there's no there's almost no flaw that I can see to it. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So Wonder Woman um, faces off against Steppenwolf. Here's Batman and Flash are trying to save some. Uh, some of the hostages and Cyborg as well escorts them uh, out of this place. And soon enough, we see uh, Batman summoning for the Nightcrawler, which is hitting his way. And uh, before he can get into any action, um, Steppenwolf kind of, uh, you know, manages to overpower Wonder Woman and slashes this, like, he hits the wall, like, the side of this wall uh, of the tower that they are at. And as the rubble hits down, we realize that it's heading to the hostages that was being rescued. And, uh, or rescued. And uh, Flash, you can see, this is one of the coolest Flash scenes, man. Uh, Flash just goes around, like, ridiculously fast just moving the rubble that is hitting to these hostages out of the way and you can tell that he's not holding back when he's moving this rubble because he knows that uh, he can safely move rubble out of the way because if it destroys the rubble it's not a problem for him but uh, moving the hostages would have been a lot more difficult because he could uh, rupture these hostages bodies if he moves too fast so man the scene like if you were to slow down this scene uh, like at 0.25, uh, I can't do that unfortunately, I'm just pausing and playing as I, as I do this. But if you could really slow it down, I think you would see so much detail in the way Flash does it. Uh, and it's so amazing. And of course Cyborg comes down to also help Flash and you know they got that done. Uh, and then the fight between uh, Wonder Woman and Steppenwolf of course continues. Now it's joined by Batman who comes in with the Nightcrawler and just blows things up. And the fight scene, right, right. Like this entire fight scene, I felt was really well done. Uh, of course, it's not it's not an all out fight because um, Steppenwolf is his only objective is to try to investigate where the mother box is, and since he doesn't, uh, you know, he can't find that knowledge, he leaves uh, while blowing up this this kind of uh, tunnel way that is attached to Gotham Harbor. And so, as the flood comes in, uh, what do you call this? Aquaman shows up and saves them. 
uh, from the flood. But what I really found awkward as well is how Aquaman would know where to find them. I really would like an explanation to that. I felt that this part was poorly explained. Like we know Aquaman is going to come and join the League to help them, but how he knows that they are here uh, closer to Gotham Harbor felt a little bit, um, you know, like like a little bit like it's, it's, a, it's a plot hole, if you ask me, because um, we all know Cyborg knows that the team is meeting up on the rooftop because of the bad signal. And of course, he's Cyborg. He could just listen into everyone of, everyone's microphones. Uh, you know, he could track Batman down based on his, uh, his gadget that he uses to communicate with Alfred. There's so many ways for Cyborg to figure it out. But how did Aquaman know that they would be here? That, I felt, was a little bit weird. Uh, but... It is possible that Aquaman was just heading towards Gotham, and upon hearing the uh, fight, uh, he came to the right place. That is possible, because he knows that Batman is in Gotham. Uh, he has that knowledge. So he, it's possible that he wanted to finally meet up with Batman and talk to him, but before he could get that conversation going, uh, he heard this fight taking place and decides to join the League. I think maybe a line of him saying that would have uh, made things a little bit clearer, but it's fine. I mean... Uh, we can we can fill things up with our imagination, so I guess that's okay. But still, it would have been nice if they explained it. So um, they 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 get off on the Nightcrawler. Cyborg is now taking control more so of the technology. He takes it over from Alfred, and you can really see Cyborg is starting to kind of um, take over that role from Alfred of being that. Uh, sidekick that handles Batman's gadgets, right? And uh, this thing goes on throughout the film. We see Cyborg eventually take over the the uh, troop carrier and possibly more things in the future as he's becoming more and more powerful and aware of his capabilities. Because he's also able to repair and put things back together as we will see in a later scene with his um, dad's uh, recorder, which he recorded his voice in. So I find all of that pretty cool. Uh, the growth of Cyborg is shown. Even the growth of Flash is shown. Uh, so yeah, anyway. Uh, shortly after that, we see Steppenwolf hit back and uh, he, you know, he, he kind of regroups with his parademons at the monolith. And at the monolith, he already has the two mother boxes without the third one. But for some reason, he hears the mother boxes calling out to him. And as he reaches towards one of them, they give him the insight that the, uh, what do you call this, the anti-life equation uh, actually exists on Earth. Now, here's the thing, right? There is this uh, kind of uh, gap uh, between the time when the Themyscirians fought off Uxus to the time the Mother Boxes remained quiet to the time they finally awoke when Superman died. And what I mean by that is Superman only came to Earth like 30 plus years ago, right? Uh, the Mother Boxes still did not awaken before that. So if, they, if, if the currently the plot is saying that the Mother Boxes didn't awaken because uh, Superman was alive, before Superman came to Earth, why were they still asleep? So there has to have been some protector, and most likely it's a lantern, uh, because uh, Steppenwolf is clearly saying no lanterns here, no Kryptonians. And uh, when we go through this dialogue, we realize that he says lanterns first, and he, then he says Kryptonians. So it is possible that 30 years before Superman arrived to Earth, there was a lantern protecting it, and a lantern should have been, you know, this lantern was powerful enough to keep the uh, mother boxes at bay. And so before that lantern, there must have been someone else, or maybe there was an armada of lanterns. So all this while, there would have been a lantern protecting Earth, especially, you know, this is possible, especially because uh, you, after you see Uxus defeating the first lantern, and, you know, the ring pausing in front of him because of his willpower, and then after he gets shot by Artemis Arrow, you know, his willpower is gone, so the ring finds someone else. It is possible that the ring had started finding a chain of lanterns on Earth, and this thing continued until the point when Superman, you know, rose to power. And it is possible that when the lantern knew that there is a Superman on Earth, maybe maybe just a few years ago, like about a decade ago, right? Maybe the lantern knew that there is this guy out there with way more power than me and I need not be here. It is possible the lantern left Earth to go and protect something else. And when the last lantern left Earth, that is when Superman was like, the only protector left. And when he died, the mother boxes knew that there's no Kryptonian, no lanterns, and called out to Steppenwolf. So this is my theory. 
that there has been a long line of lanterns protecting the earth. On top of the, uh, you know, the, the, the Atlanteans, on top of the Themyscirians, there was a lantern. Uh, because we know the gods, the, the old gods are not around to protect anymore because Ares has betrayed them and all the other gods are dead and we get this lore from the Wonder Woman film. So there's only Ares and Zeus left. And while Zeus can of course create more gods, but it takes a lot of time for these gods to regenerate. Uh, but the only one who can kill a god is a god and Ares did that. Um, so with Ares and Zeus being the only two protectors among the gods, uh, yeah, it's possible that a lantern was the one that was actually uh, protecting everything else over the long years. So I would really like to find out more about this. Let me know what you guys think. Possibly there's more theories out there, but this is mine. So anyway, uh, after we see uh, Steppenwolf get the vision of the anti-life equation, we go back to scenes of the League just communicating with each other, trying to figure out uh, where the last mother box is. And Cyborg comes down to say, I'm the one holding the last mother box. And, uh, you know, uh, we cut back to a scene of Steppenwolf after that, informing the sword, and finally, uh, our first reveal of Darkseid uh, in you know through this the, the Monolith's communication device, and he comes and tells Steppenwolf, uh, "You redeem yourself by getting the last uh, Mother Box, forming the Unity, and I will come to Earth to get my great prize." And his great prize apparently is the Anti-Life Equation, which he has been searching for, and he has destroyed a hundred thousand worlds searching for it. And man, that shot and that scene of Darkseid talking his voice everything about it is just super cool and i was just geeking out over the fact that we are finally seeing dark side uh, on the big screen and unfortunately it's not the big screen for me because it's my tv but man someday i will see it on the big screen when they replay this in theaters which they absolutely will and i will be buying more more and more tickets just to go and see it that's for sure so uh, we get back to a scene of Batman's hangar, uh, where you know uh, Cyborg finally witnesses the troop carrier, and the team kind of come together in this, ta you know, like they have a they have a round table talk basically. It's a square table, but I know it's a, they have a table talk, and uh, they essentially uh, discussing about Victor's origin, uh, the origin of the mother boxes, and all of that is beautifully shown how uh, the the mother boxes obtained by the Nazis during their war, and then eventually uh, when the American Americans invaded, they got the mother box, and that's how it ended up in Star Labs. And Victor's father used it to uh, create the cyborg and felt that it's a good idea to keep it away from man, so he, you know, uh, hid it in his house, which is an absolutely dangerous place to hide it, uh, which is what caused all these problems. But regardless, it created Victor, which seems to be their. Uh, you know, the next step they can possibly take. So they formed this theory where uh, the same way the mother box recreated Victor and the fact that the mother box is not evil or good, it just is a change engine of some sort, which is what this uh, part is all about, right? The change and the change machine, right? So it's, it's like a change machine. It's just, it just doesn't care whether you're good or bad. It just recreates or rebuilds uh, your matter to try to make you whole again. And uh, they all realize that this means that it's possible that the technology it has could be used to bring Superman back to life. So, yeah, I felt this was cool. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of versions of comics where if you go back to the rebirth of Superman, uh, you realize that when he comes back, he actually comes back uh, weaker because he needs to wear the black suit, which is a regenerative suit, but eventually gets stronger as a whole. Because his rebirth surprisingly gives him uh, newer abilities. And this is why Zack is trying to show the parallels between the rebirth of Christ to the rebirth of Superman. Because when Superman comes back, he is even more powerful as a savior. Uh, where he has newer abilities, he's stronger overall, and um, he, he has found a better purpose for himself. And so I like those parallels, but regardless, uh, you know, with or without them, we would still like what we're seeing. Now we get the scene between Martha and Lois Lane actually uh, having a beautiful conversation about their loss, uh, which is, uh, you know, Martha is like, I'm, you know, everyone's grieving over a symbol when they don't realize that, you know, this guy, he, he's my son, you know, like, they don't realize how he means to me and you as a person, as Clark. They don't care about Clark. All they care about is Superman. And I felt that this was such a powerful and emotional scene. And I was so upset that this was cut to the scene of Martha turning into Martian Manhunter. Like, if this was just Martha, I would have been super happy with it. But I felt that the reason it was turned into Martian Manhunter was because... Um, 
even though we know that Zack was given the liberty to recreate his vision and fulfill what he wanted, I feel that there were still some limitations. And I know this for a fact as well because I'm not I'm not just telling this on theory. I'm telling this on a fact because if you guys look for the Vanity Fair article uh, between Zack Snyder and, of course, Vanity Fair, I think it's by Anthony, some, some guy called Anthony is the one that wrote it. Uh, I could be wrong. You guys can look it up, though. But it's by Vanity Fair. And you can you can check over that article where Zack really tells you uh, his intentions and he gets really up close and personal. And while it's not the complete picture, it tells you a lot about what he had in mind. And uh, it seems like he did want to have a lantern showing up towards the end of this film. But uh, Warner Brothers were like, no, we need we need to keep lantern in our books because we want to use him for something else. And because they have another lantern project i felt that zach had to more forcefully uh push in uh the martian manhunter into this because uh fine if you're not gonna let me show lantern i'm gonna show uh martian manhunter a lot more and while we do know that his storyboards had him uh plan to introduce uh what do you call this martian manhunter uh, I feel that the uh, the dialogues in the Martha scene was possibly intended for just Martha and Lois. And uh, there was maybe another scene where Martian Manhunter does visit Lois as Martha. But uh, this is because he knows that uh, Lois talks to Martha like like every now and then, right? Like Martha has been checking on Lois. And so he takes the opportunity on in one of those moments to also check on Lois uh, but uh, he does it because he wants to gain some information or something like that. But that this part is my theory, but I do know for a fact that uh, Zach did, did push on wanting to have a lantern as part of the league, but uh, had to just go with Martian Manhunter. So there is some gray area between this. I'm not really sure uh, what, what you know, how the original idea turned out or planned. I think the only way to really find out is to ask Zach himself, which uh, I'm sure someone out there will have the privilege of doing it. So there is that. Now, uh, shortly after we see, you know, uh, Martian Manhunter, uh, you know, Martha evolved to Manhunter, we see Manhunter evolve to Swanwick, and Swanwick walks off. I'm not sure what's the reason of this. Uh, I think the, the, they just want to show us that, yes, he was Swanwick all along, because a lot of people didn't know this. But even if we didn't evolve to Swanwick, and Manhunter just, you know, face out of the walls, or just disappeared, or whatever, I think we would still knew, know that, uh, you know, uh, there's a there's a Martian Manhunter on the loose, and that's I think that's fine, fair enough. But um, we do know for a fact that uh, it, you know the the, the uh, Swanwick was supposed to become Martian Manhunter, but Martha becoming Martian Manhunter was probably what was not originally in the script. You get what I mean? Like it is possible. It like okay. Let me let me just put this straight, right? Let me just put this straight. Here's my theory. My theory is that. Martha was supposed to meet Lois Lane, have that uh, intimate conversation with her, and you know they, they, the two of them just grieving over Clock, right? This was the original idea. And in another scene, it was General Swanwick visiting Lois. And he wanted to um, also just grieve with her and understand that Superman is gone. Uh, he's not there for Clock. And then uh, he evolves into Martian Manhunter uh, just to give us that reveal, and he goes off. So, so Martha was not supposed to become uh, Martian Manhunter, but I guess it was put such that uh, you know she was forced to become Martian Manhunter uh, because you know they just wanted to speed things up. This is my theory. I could be wrong. So yeah. Anyway, we get back to a scene of the leak, uh, you know, in in Batman's hangar, and they realize that this is a crazy idea, but they go with it. They want to uh, use you know use the mother box to revive Superman, and yeah, they agree on that. So that's it for part four. Uh, and actually part five. So yeah, anyway, I've told you guys my theory. I told you guys what I understand, what I expect. Uh, I know I could be wrong. And the only real way would be to ask uh, Zach himself about it. But I felt that this part four was really cool in the sense where this is where the team starts to build a plan, where they start to really work together as a team, uh, you know, and they start to to think things together as a league. Because now they're, they're essentially they're just this league. The only thing they're missing is, of course, uh, Superman, Martian Manhunter, and Green Lantern. Uh, three really, really big guns. But 
you know, this is essentially like they're already, you know, a sort of a Justice League. They are a team who are united, who want to fight against Steppenwolf. And even though they may not be strong enough, this is the team as is, right? So I felt that uh, part four really shows us that um, everything has, has changed. You know, everything now has changed. Uh, so the the name change machine I felt signified the bigger picture of how uh, now you actually have a team of heroes, no longer just a Batman trying to get people together. Batman has done it. He has actually got people together, and they are they are actually a team that is ready to unite and fight Steppenwolf. But they just feel like they need Superman to to get it done right. So I felt the whole idea of the change machine and everything was really cool. Uh, you know, Cyborg is finally growing out to to play a bigger role in the league. Uh, you have the Aquaman actually supporting them. Uh, you have the Flash actually, uh, you know, uh, like readily thinking together with the team. Uh, they're all together. They're all united in this. And um, I felt that this was a great way to kind of come to the center of the film. And uh, so I'm looking at about 221. Uh, and in 221, it's, you know, part five is just starting. So I'm going to end this episode here. We'll be back with the breakdown of part five. Let me know what you guys think, what your theories are. I really want to, uh, you know, hear hear what everyone has to say. And I, I really hope that someday um, Zach himself would explain it. Uh, I, I know he has given different versions of answers because you know a lot of things uh, when it comes to creative work really change on the fly uh, you as a director will have your idea your scriptwriter will have an idea even your producer may say no no maybe i think this wouldn't be so good for tv maybe this would be better uh, you know or, or this is what uh, the, the studio wants so this is what the kids will like uh, and also there's the actors themselves who say that i have an idea do you want to hear what i have and then sometimes uh, and, and you work with like not one you work like a dozen actors and each actor will have their own idea and uh, when all these comes together things will change right uh, from from the storyboards to the script to the final decision the multiple takes uh, there are a lot there's a lot of room for changes and uh, I think I think it feels great to, to actually talk about all these possibility of changes considering I'm talking about the change machine so yep now that I got that out of the way I'll see you guys in part five and hopefully uh, you guys will know that part five is going to be a lot bigger, right? Because we're going to get you're going to get something a lot more serious going on. Adios, guys. Take care.